Hello everybody, welcome back to my Gregorious Maths video. In this video, I'll be talking about Lloyd Baer's fixed point theorem. And um, this is kind of a tribute, I guess, to William Lloyd Baer, who actually recently passed away, kind of sad, sadly enough. Um, so I guess this video, um, it was suggested to me, I was unaware actually, um, before, but um, when it was suggested to me last week, you know, I thought it would be appropriate to do this theorem of the week in his honour, and hopefully I can do the theorem justice and explain it nicely. Um, so the plan for the video is to go over basically the very technical statements, you know, prove it, etc, etc. And then at the end, I'll discuss kind of what the statement actually means um, and its application and, you know, how it relates to, for example, Cantor's theorem and, you know, stuff in logic like that. So let's just get into it. Um, so firstly, here's the technical statement of the theorem. So what it says is, let f from b to, um, from a to b to the a, and um, this is, um, whenever I say a and b, those are objects of some category c, which has, you know, an appropriate notion of products and stuff like that. Um, so let f be a map from a to this function space b to the a, um, b, and I'm going to use a term which I'll define in a second, weakly point surjective. Then, any map um, g from b to itself has a fixed point. Okay, so let me just, I'd, obviously I need to define a lot of these terms, so let me get straight into that. Before I define weakly point surjective, I'll define just point surjective, and um, that is, um, so if we're given some f from a to b, f is point surjective, If the f um, for all B, there exists an A such that the following diagram proves. So one is the terminal object. Now for all B, there exists an A such that this diagram commutes. And I think the reason it's called point surjectivity is if we take a look at the example of our category of sets, well, um, our terminal object is just the set with one element. Um, and so a function from one to a is just going to be picking out an element of a. And so for this to be true, really all that we're saying is that for all b in b, There exists an A in A such that F of A equals B. And well, of course, this is precisely just the definition of surjectivity. So in the category of sets, point surjective is the same thing as surjective. Um, now, um, so that's the example of how this works. Um, now, another definition, of course, we need because it's in the actual statement is weakly point surjective. So weak point surjectivity uh, involves a more complicated diagram. So we say that f from a times b to c is weakly point surjective. If, let's see, so the following diagram commutes, so we, could, so we have to go down here via this like sort of projection map, I guess, to, from the terminal object to the terminal object times itself. We 
going to go down to A times B, this map I'll talk about in a second. And of course we're going to go here to C, um, via, via our original map F. And along this diagonal, we're going to go to B, and then we'll go to C. Now, this is just any map G, this is any map B, and there exists some X, G, such that the following diagram commutes. So it's quite a complicated diagram, um, but it is um, the appropriate definition of weak point surjectivity, I guess. Um, I'm not sure how they came up with this diagram, um, but there you go. Um, this is the definition of weak point surjectivity. And so, okay, we actually are now equipped with everything that we need in order to prove the theorem above. Um, and so we'll do that and then we'll talk about what it means. Um, where a fixed point, actually, I should point out, a fixed point is, um, so for some G from B to B, this has a fixed point if there exists um, some map A from 1 to B. such that um, G is equal to G A. Yeah. If there exists some map A, then A is called a fixed point. Um, yeah, I thought I should just get that definition out of the way because it's slightly different to what we might think. So now we are equipped with all the definitions. We can go on to prove it, and then hopefully we'll discuss it later. So, what is the proof of this theorem? So, actually what we're going to do is we're going to look at the transpose, which is, um, because we have that POM of um, A, B to the A, is in bijection with POM A cross A, B, we can map some map F, to a map in here. So that map in here is what we're going to actually be looking at. So we'll denote that map by epsilon of f. Now, what does weak point surjectivity actually say? Well, it tells us, okay, let's just draw out the diagram, shall we? We've got one, and we go down to one cross one via this projection. We're going to go down to um, A cross A this time, A cross A. We're going to go across to B via epsilon of F. And along here, we are going to go down to A via just some A and then via via a map which I will specifically define, now we're going to go from A to B. Now this map from A to B, um, yeah, I'm going to specifically define it. So, oh dear. So, A, so firstly, we're going to go to A cross A via this projection map. Then, what we're gonna go do is we're gonna go via the transpose to B, and then we're just going to pick any random map G from B to B. And this is where this map comes in to the proof. This is just any map from B to B. So that's what we're going to define, because of course this is any G, so we can pick this to be whatever we want. So we're going to pick it to be this composition here. So I need to make sure that I get this the right way around. Um, so yeah, we're going to go G composed with epsilon of F composed with delta A, like so. And here is, well, there exists some, we'll call it XH, 
such that the whole thing commutes. Now, what does this commutativity actually mean? If we write it out, what it actually means is, um, well, what the, by definition of commutativity, we have, if we go down, down, across, it's the same thing as going down and then down. So, we have, um, again, I need to make sure to get the commutative, the com composition size the right way around, but I believe what it means is that epsilon of f composed with xh times a composed with delta 1 is equal to, I'll write this in blue for emphasis, <laughs> um, so let me write it in blue, um, I've got to go the right way around again, so, um, yeah, we've got to write this one first, so g composed with epsilon of f composed with delta a composed with a, like so. Okay, so now, basically what we want to do is we want to somehow get a fixed point. So we want something so that g is equal to g composed with a. Um, but right now that's looking a bit difficult. So the key is that this is actually a natural transformation, this projection. So what does this mean? It means that, sorry, I should probably just say it's natural, um, means that the following diagram commutes. So if we go from 1 to 1 cross 1 via um, um, delta 1, if we go down to A via A and across and down to A cross A, and if we go here via xh times a, then what do we have? Well, we have that this, then this, is equal to this, then this. Or in normal English, <laughs> um, this means that um, delta a composed of a is precisely the same as x cross xh xh cross a composed with delta 1, like so. And so what we can do is we can swap out this um, for this, and suddenly what we're getting is, if we sub it in, we get that this is g composed with epsilon of f composed with delta a composed with a, now this becomes epsilon of f composed with this, which is this. So I'll write it in red for extra super emphasis, um, is precisely delta a composed with a. Actually, I'll write this in delta a. a. And so I think I wrote the wrong definition of fixed point. Yeah, it should be g a equals g. Um, sorry, g a a equals g a. Yeah, there we go. Sorry, I wrote the wrong definition of um, fixed point. This is the correct definition of fixed point, and we see that our fixed point is. I'll do it. Epsilon of F composed with delta A composed with A, which sends us from 1 to, so it goes from 1 to A, then delta A sends us to A times A. I'll write it in here. Delta A sends us from there to there, and then epsilon of F takes us to B is a fixed point, QED. So this is actually one of my favourite types of proof where you just have to chase the diagrams and stuff. Um, 
And that is the proof. So we've successfully constructed a fixed point. And so I could end the video here, but I don't think it will be doing this theorem justice because it seems very random, kind of. Okay, cool, we proved this result, but I mean, you know, it's just very random. It's just a category theoretical quirk. But um, turns out that that is not the case. Um, turns out that um, this has specific links to stuff like Cantor's theorem as a corollary of this. And what it notices is if we look at, say, for example, the tip, the, if we look at the diagonalization argument, the famous one, um, where you take in, um, you try to list all the real numbers and you um, f get a new one by going across the diagonals. The point there is that we are getting some h from, we're, we're getting some map and that map takes in a bunch of digits and it, the point is it has no fixed point. So it outputs a completely new real number and the existence of such a map, the existence of a map with no fixed point. So for example, we could have um, a digit n maps to n plus one mod nine or something like that, roughly speaking. And that has no fixed point. And so because it has no fixed point, there is no surjection from the naturals to the reals like so. And if we look at the statement of Loewer's fixed point theorem, it says that if we do have a surjection, then every map must have a fixed point. Otherwise there is no su su such surjection and the cardinalities are strictly smaller. And a similar argument can be used to prove Cantor's, uh, Cantor's theorem about power sets and stuff. Um, you know, there's loads of really nice applications in logic and set theory. There's loads of other ones as well. I mean, it's not just Cantor's diagonalization argument. There's loads of stuff that I haven't really looked into much. Um, but it, it's really just a unified way of um, talking about all diagonalization arguments, which is very neat, actually. Especially if you're into logic and set theory, I would very much recommend looking up this theorem, looking deeper into it, and um, yeah, it's a really cool th theorem which uses category theory to unify it, so it's a uh, work of genius, um, because, you know, you have to think about this, right, you have to come up with an appropriate notion of surjectivity, an appropriate notion of fixed point, then you have to, so first you have to have the insight, then you have to do all of this. And then you have to go back and check that it actually works out for, um, you know, the standard results in set theory. So if you are into set theory and logic, I would very much recommend looking up Loewer's fixed point theorem because you'll find all sorts of applications, um, which you might find interesting, uh, especially if you're also into category theory. Um, and so, yeah, um, thank you to, I think it was Dennis for the suggestion. Um, you know, you made me look into branch of maths, which I, you know, I was obviously aware of, but I hadn't really looked that deeply into, and it was actually a pretty cool journey, especially seeing the connection to category theory. And of course, um, you know, as a tribute to um, mathematicians recently passed away, I think it was very appropriate. Um, so yeah, um, thank you guys for watching. It is half term, so expect a few more uploads this week. And, um, yeah, I'll see you, if not earlier, then in the next Theorem of the Week. Goodbye.